Uh, so we can go ahead and get started, you guys. It's 204. We want to respect your time, but thank you guys for um, being a part of this panel. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Yeah, um, and uh, it's good to see everybody. Very nice to see you. Um, I'm really excited about this day. Um, so uh, I first wanted to um, introduce my guest moderator from Rise of Animation, Chanira. Pew, pew, pew. What's going on? Hey. Hey. This is Chanira's first panel on Rise of Animation, and uh, and uh, happy and uh, privileged to uh, share the moderating duties with her. Chanira, how are you? I'm pretty good. I'm really good. And cold New Jersey right now. <laughs> yeah, New but, Jersey uh, represent. Like, can you say a little bit about like uh, um, you've been with us for in rise of like a month, right? You're super new. Uh, somewhat super new. I started as a volunteer in the panels department, and then I worked my way up to panel supervisor for Rise Up. And mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the first uh, panels that I created uh, with the help of Bobby and everyone else in Rise Up Animation. Uh, and I am aspiring to become a storyboard artist. I worked in retail for yeah. 11 years. I'm trying to change a uh, career. So here I am. Awesome. <laughs> right on. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Can't wait, man. You're gonna you're gonna crush it. Um, and then and then uh, we um, we're very very honored and privileged to have uh, Lauren Scan and Ernesto Matamoros Cox. Did I do that right? That's right. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, both editors on the hit series Arcane. Yeah. Oh yeah. Jeez. Congratulations, by the way, guys, on how well received that show's doing that holy moly everybody's talking about it um and it's beautiful too and the storytelling mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> um so if you can uh, uh lawrence lawrence and ernesto just give us a little bit of a um kind of a background of like um your career kind of leading up to arcane um and what you've been up to. Um, so Lawrence, do you wanna, do you wanna kick us off? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, so like we mentioned, uh, I came from the East Coast, uh, moved out to LA to pursue my, my dreams of Hollywood, if you will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've done all sorts of things, uh, obviously, like everyone does when they first come out here, but uh, ultimately started going towards animation editing uh, because of you know, the amount of creative leeway it gives us in storytelling, you know, there's there's a lot that goes into to editing, but animation editing in particular. And so uh, I've worked around town, you know, Warner Brothers uh, a lot. Uh, just wrapped up oh, on wow. Space Jam last year uh, with oh, uh, wow. with Chris Cartagena. Um, it was a really fun show where you know you get to see live action and animation uh, come together. Um, yeah. And then you know, at one point, I think it was probably what was it like maybe five years ago. Arcane is been around in the works for a long time but around five years or so ago more uh, now i think yeah yeah i got a call um from riot which was you know i, I played the the video game before in the past and and league of legends and such before and they called me up and was like hey would you come in and and talk about something about going on and kind of being curious because i've never worked for a video game company before i was like yeah sure why not i'll, I'll come check you guys out um, and that's, you know, where I met Ernesto, so. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, cool. For me, cool. I, I, I've been kind of in the industry for a, a, a fairly long time now. I'm, I'm 37 years old, but I actually started editing when I was 15. Um, wow. I, I, cool. I, I kind of found it by chance. Um, I, in my, I was in high school. I have a, a really extensive martial arts background. I started doing martial arts when I was four years old, like right when I came to the States, really. And um, I'd been training, you know, martial arts every day for, I'm 37. I think I stopped when I was 30, right? Um, mm -hmm. from, from injuries and stuff. But in high school, mm -hmm. my, uh, a buddy of mine was doing his, uh, his thesis for, or like his final project for, um, for his film class. And he'd asked me to be the villain in it. And so I was like, oh yeah, right on. <laughs> and uh, at the time in, in high school, I was, I was kind of small. I hadn't had a growth spur yet. And I, I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to try holding the camera 
but at, we were using like this big beta camera it was like way too heavy my like crazy um and but he goes well why don't you come into the edit room and, and kind of see us put it together and um, oh. so I, I i went in and uh my a buddy of mine from school that i didn't know actually was involved at the time in any any you know editing stuff uh he actually was one of the assistant editors on Arcane, we brought him on to help on. Uh, oh, he was, uh, he was like a uh, like two years ahead of, of, of us, um, and he was sitting down on one of those like colorful IMAX. And <laughs> he was working on Final <laughs> Cut one point one or two. And I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, I'm, I'm editing. So well, what, what is that? And he goes, well, why don't you sit down? Let me show you. And so he taught me Final Cut real quick, and he gave me wow. a bunch of footage. And he goes, all right, just you know, play, right? And this was before the age of cell phones. And uh, like everybody readily having a cell phone and I uh -huh. sat down and this is not an exaggeration. Like if any of you guys out there have ADHD, you can kind of, uh, uh, or ADD, you can kind of really uh, 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 relate to this. Uh, he showed me how to do it, gave me a bunch of footage. He was sitting next to me on my left and he goes, okay, go play. I sat down <laughs> guys, and I went, I went like this. And then all of a sudden he burst through the door on the right hand side. And I was like, the hell and he goes have you been here the whole time it's 6 p.m your mom is going crazy and i was like oh my god and so i you know you just like, got lost in it I got, man. I got lost in it and i i realized that it was because i um, I, can, I draw too and back then i was drawing a lot more and um yeah. i i realized that this was something that could really grab my attention for a you know for i could get lost in this thing and wow. that's kind of how I started getting into film. But I went from, yeah. I, I went the live action kind of guerrilla filmmaking. And then I went into documentaries. And then I went into, uh, well, I went into series first. I was an, like a apprentice editor on uh, NYPD Blue when I was still in high school. I would leave school, oh, shit. school and I would take the bus <laughs> to Fox. And then I would take nice. the bus from Fox over to my martial arts school and then rinse and repeat every day, right? Got it. So, um, I, and I went from that to like documentaries and TV commercials. And then uh, I got the chance to, uh, somebody offered me the opportunity to be an assistant editor on, uh, on Surf's Up, right? But oh, yeah. I, at the time, yeah. at the time, like I, I, I really believe in, uh, you know, like it, to a certain degree, you fake it till you make it, right? That's really great. But I also <laughs> don't like uh, going into a situation where I'm not, uh, the best person at that moment suited for that job. And I don't wanna let anybody down that's relying on me to really do it. And at mm -hmm. the time, I didn't feel like I had enough avid experience, uh, avid mm -hmm. media composer. And so mm -hmm. I said, uh, while I didn't know it, I didn't know it well enough to be like a first assistant. And I also didn't know animation. And so mm -hmm. I said, well, if you guys, how about if you guys get the opportunity, to, you know, an opportunity comes up as like, a PA or something, I would love to learn mm -hmm. animation from the ground up and go mm -hmm. from there. And so mm -hmm. they were like, that's weird, but okay. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I, I left and a few months later, I got a call to be an assistant on open season. And I, I took that. And so I got to learn animation that way from the ground mm -hmm. up. Um, yeah. Years later, I ended up uh, as uh, the kind of lead editor on the How to Train Your Dragon series at uh, DreamWorks for about six and a half years. Wow. Um, yeah, oh. very cool. Yeah, which is kind very of cool. where uh, where the whole riot thing comes in a, a little mm -hmm. bit. Where, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I had I had hired uh, temporarily an assistant editor, Stephen Meek, to come and backfill for somebody that was going on vacation. And a few years after that, he he had actually been hired as an assistant at Riot on Arcane, and they were looking for editors, and he put my name in the hat. And huh. he came, yeah. and you know, he asked me if I was interested. I said sure, and that's how mm -hmm. that. Whole and got started and then nice. Lawrence walked through the door one day and it was love at first <laughs> and then you guys just and then you guys fell in love well I mean it sounds it sounds goofy I mean Lawrence and I are actually best friends in real life like he's 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 gonna be the best man at my wedding oh really yeah he's yeah I mean we spend congratulations I spend more time with this Lawrence is so than, pure I love it <laughs> yeah I mean two love. two of two of my grooms my best man and one of my other groomsmen are actually I met on our king whoa yeah. no kidding yeah i love that yeah so sure, keep on giving 
Lawrence and I are still, <laughs> yeah. are still, you know, we're we're business partners and we work on things together. And uh, we have That's like we yeah. have a, actually a handful of projects that we're currently developing right now that would be, you know, That's and, awesome. That's so. so cool. That's so cool. Another thing about the industry, you guys, is like when you get in, you'll meet people. They will be lifelong friends. They will be like brothers and sisters to you. It, it'll happen, you know, because you'll go to the trenches, go through the trenches together. You'll go through training together. You'll go through all these crunch times together. And at the end, you're like, I have lifelong friends. And that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Arcane shipping is real. Tito James says <laughs> arcane shipping is real. So, um, I mean, that's, I mean, that's yeah. kind of the thing about like, you know, uh, animation industry in general, or just the industry in general is you spend so much time with these people. I mean, minimum 60 hours a week, right? Yeah. And these, are, these end up being the people that you spend the most amount of time with. And yep. if you build genuine connections, I don't know if you guys ever watched Survivor, right? But um, <laughs> that show Survivor, I feel like a lot of people that make it really far are people that build genuine connections with the other survivors. Mm. <laughs> and so, mm. I, I, mm. you know, I kind of, it's akin to that, right? Um, you build these connections, yeah. you make real friendships, you kind of talk and you're in the trenches. So it does mm -hmm. really, it, it can really become a real thing because these are people that you have a lot in common with, you know? Yeah. Like 3 a.m. screening pushes and things like that. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I should say uh, before we kick off the conversation, if you guys have any questions for uh, Lawrence and Ernesto, uh, we'll try to keep an eye on the chat and then just kind of like casually like kind of like pose it to them as well. But um, uh, Chinero, do you want to get started on the uh, questions for the conversation? Uh, yeah, sure. Let me just uh, get my awesome. questions out. So, mm -hmm. okay. So uh, we do have a- At disclaimer. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, so we should tell you guys, uh, if you have watched Arcane yet, great. But if you have not, especially the first couple of episodes, we strongly recommend to you know, reconsider watching those first and coming back here uh, because it will be spoilers. So <laughs> we'll just wait 10 seconds so you guys can think about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you were giving them 10 seconds to watch it. <laughs> I mean, you could do that too, but... Uh, Loose you... lips sink airships, guys. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, airships. So if you don't mind being spoiled, you could stay. But if you want to watch the show... Just peer, you might want to leave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, someone said I watched it five times already. So <laughs> I think we're good. <laughs> hey, nice, nice. That was wow. me, Laura. That's that's hardcore. <laughs> well done. Uh, so okay, let's uh start with the uh, questions. Uh so um Lawrence and Ernesto, uh just tell me what what is your role as editors on Arcane? Like how would you describe it? What do you get? What is your what is your day to day basis working on the episode? Uh, so, you know, our, I think as editors in general, uh, we're you know we're the paintbrush, right? And so it's our job to see the director's vision and the writer's vision through as much as possible. But on top of that you know, kind of like when you're painting, sometimes you get happy accidents, right? And mm -hmm. for us, I think, you know, a, a big part of our job is to mind meld with the director. Uh, you know, for me personally, a big goal of mine is to be able to, if the director's like, oh, can you, I'm already there. Like I'm already doing this thing that they're about to ask to do, right? Because we're on the same wavelength. And mm -hmm. for, for us, you know, we're also storytellers, right? We're not, we're not technicians. And so mm -hmm. uh, it's our job to also add to the story, see the things sometimes that others don't see and, mm -hmm. uh, and bring those things to light and try and you know, uh, advocate for ideas and, and, and be kind of the champions of a lot of these, sometimes ideas that others don't understand or see, right? And we have to kind of bring those to life and, and, and help others see the ideas through, right? Like the thing that Ernesto's kind of touching on is, um, you know, uh, compared to a lot of other, I guess, uh, crafts in animation making, editing is one of the ones where 
it's super hyper collaborative, right? Like we don't actually draw or create anything ourselves. That, that's the storyboard artists, right? The, the, you know, the animators are the ones who, who design the movements, right? The, the layout artists are the ones who choose camera stuff, but edit is where all these different facets come together. And so as a craft, it's, it's one that's based highly in being collaborative. You have to be a good teamwork individual essentially. Mm -hmm. So, and it's like, even though we don't, necessarily make all the ingredients like we are the hands that help put them together for the director for the producers in a way that will seem pleasing to everyone you know and it's mm -hmm. kind of a, it, it, to a certain degree it's also a very you know especially in animation i feel like it's very much an underappreciated slash like a uh, misunderstood aspect of you know animation right and what it goes what goes into actually making animation um a lot of times if you can't you know a lot of times like you know our job is to make sure that you can't tell that something just happened right like yeah. you know to make it feel seamless um if you can tell that something's off with the editing then we're probably not doing our job right but so mm -hmm. to a certain degree, like we're not, you know, like Arcane, for example, the, the arts file is so visual, like so different, right? That the moment you see it, you're like, holy hell, this is crazy, right? And mm -hmm. then you see the animation, you're like, wow, that's great. But mm -hmm. your mind doesn't immediately go to, wow, the editing is insane in this, right? Because <laughs> like, that's not really a craft that, while it is actually visual, it's not something that people really notice or understand a lot of times. You know, right. mm -hmm. um, I, I can't tell you how many times we've had to explain to people what we actually do, like when it comes mm -hmm. to editing and to some other editors, actually, yeah. you know, wow. a, a, a editors established people. They're like, well, we thought you guys just did this, this and that. And it's like, nah, chief. <laughs> You're talking about <laughs> there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a difference between live action editing and animation editing. And so, I mean, yeah. all the crafts are very similar and overlap in a lot of ways there are aspects to animation editing that are specific to this medium, if you will, so. Mm. I can tell you, as, mm -hmm. somebody, like, as somebody who has done both live action editing, you know, commercials, documentaries, series of, you know, feature, um, mm -hmm. action, drama, live action, all that, I can tell you right now that I've never actually sat here and pulled my hair out while editing uh, live action. You know, like, I've never been like, I've never been like, what the hell? Because, uh -huh. you know, like, <laughs> it's, y y there's, you're kind of with live action you you get you get your shots right you kind of have the meat and potatoes of what you're doing and then you're building the story off of that animation mm -hmm. it's you're you have your shots but what you're getting is thousands and thousands of drawings right so mm -hmm. it's really up to us to say okay you know mm -hmm. uh uh you know victor just walked from here to there and it took him two seconds or victor just walked from here to there and it took him two minutes Right, because he's saying this, you know, he's doing this giant monologue here. So it's and it's three drawings, mm. right? And mm. so for mm. us, like when we're doing animatic, it's it is a lot different because we're just getting storyboards and dialogue. And then they're like, okay, go. And we're like, all right, yeah. you know, it's, it's a lot more it's a lot more blue sky initially. There during the storyboarding phase. I mean, there are times where directors will literally sit in the room with the editor and be calling out shots or be doing shots on the fly to, to fill in gaps versus like in a live action scenario, you would have to go back to reshoots or, you know, or whatever the case may be. So, yeah, I think we've all worked on movies where, where we, you know, we'll be editing a scene uh, and then we'll be like, oh, can we just like sub clip that sequence out and then just kind of explore this with what we've got or maybe go into <laughs> another sequence and grab some drawings and panels from this and throw that in there uh -huh. and see you know what we got can't really do yeah. that with live action like i can't be like yeah. oh you know we're in the, the yeah. den and then now we're in the mountains take those shots <laughs> if you guys hear some like scratching and bulldozing that's your dog, dog. It's my dog my sheba trying to jack nichols <laughs> well Aww. now that you brought up sheba you have to bring him or her to the camera um really quickly uh lawrence uh, that's a good point um i wanted to ask i wanted to ask here comes the dog oh no uh, I wanted to ask, like, uh, something you touched upon is, like, how... Hello, <laughs> 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 Oh, that looks... Oh, 
Um, he's, not, he's not really a dog. Right. He's an alien that took over a dog's body and is trying to figure it out. Oh, got it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'm very familiar. <laughs> I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to touch on like, and this is kind of like, um, well, the chat's going nuts. <laughs> um, we can just talk about the dog right. now. We don't need to talk yeah, about the yeah, thing. Yeah, Let's yeah, just yeah. talk about the shoe. Actually, this the panel has out. turned into Shiba Inus, eh? Um, <laughs> so, like, what? Like, <laughs> uh, like, what does it take uh, to take care of a Shiba Inu? Um, and so, rewinding back a little bit too, of just kind of, um, and this applies to like every single. Uh, department in animation or filmmaking, that kind of stuff. Like, how do you kind of um, combine the director's vision for what they want with your own creative vision uh, in your specific, you know, in editing and that kind of stuff? Do you, is that a challenge for you or um, is it easy peasy or like, can you talk to that, uh, uh, speak to that a little bit, Lawrence? Or, or, or Chibi Inu, if you want to <laughs> as well. Uh, no, go ahead, or, yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, do you want Lawrence to, to, to get this one or you want me to get this one? Go, go for Either it. Either way, guys. So, yeah, sorry. Um, so, yeah, no, I think it, it's a lot kind of like what we were just talking about where it's, you know, it's about uh, helping the director see their vision through and then adding on to it, right? Because we, there's always a, there's, there's a, there's gotta be a, um, um, uh, delineation of, of hierarchy, right? It's always a, like the director has the last say, obviously, right? But as creatives and as partners, like you get excited and you talk and you bring stuff in, you know, and yeah. you you add on to that. So if, you know, depending on the director that you're working with and who you are as an editor too, it just really, it's what you bring. It's, it's how much of that, you know, creativity you bring, how much how open they are to receiving those ideas as well. It really has to yep. do with that dynamic a lot of times, you know? Like mm -hmm. filmmaking or, or storytelling, television making um, is an extremely collaborative art form, not just, you know, in the editing room, but like, I mean, most directors uh, are, are very collaborative, right? Like you, you, as a director, you generally want to bring on people who are experts in their fields so they can help mm -hmm. contribute to your vision. And so a good director in my book is somebody who comes to the edit room with an idea as to what they want, but is open mm -hmm. to, to hearing about like different takes. And, on, and a lot of mm -hmm. directors that Ernesto and I have worked with, uh, even outside of Arcane, you know, will often ask us like, here's, here's what the script says, here's my idea, but by all means, please, if you have an idea, you know, let wow. me know what it is. And so that's mm -hmm. where the collaboration comes in, right? And in our jobs mm -hmm. as editors, the, the, the job, the work is always to do the script cut, do the director's cut first. But then mm -hmm. obviously if you have your own artistic ideas or, you know, inspirations bring that to the table and let them decide mm. if that's what they want yeah for any for anybody you know aspiring editors out there i think you know a good piece of advice when it comes to that is to touch on what lawrence just said is a, a lot of times directors are expecting to see what they know what they sent right and mm -hmm. and while it is our job to like you know see things that aren't working and and make them better or take them out if they're not working right i, I think you know from my experience it's always been a positive uh it's been always positively received to say okay well i have some ideas on how we can work on this but i wanted to show you what we got first because a lot of times if the director doesn't see it it can throw them maybe like well mm. I, was I was expecting this where is that and say like, oh well it wasn't working was it well can we see it you know and mm. and 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 so it you always want to make sure that you are presenting everything that's you know brought to you. But then if you, if it's not working, have ideas on how to fix it. Don't just say it's not working. Yeah, and, and pro tip on that front is that like the natural inclination is usually be like, oh, I'm gonna put it together, but it's not gonna work and whatever. Like, no, false. You especially yeah. if something doesn't feel like it's working well, you gotta really give it like your A plus 110% game to really prove it out as to like, this is the absolute best we can take this version to. Yeah, for, for me, for example, um, anytime that I show something, even if it's the first time I'm showing something, I always try to go in with the mentality of, hey, maybe it's not just gonna be the director and I watching this. Maybe an executive is gonna walk through the door and is like, oh, you guys are watching this. Can I sit down and watch it? How are, <laughs> how are they gonna receive what we're about to show right now? So you, mm. like me, like you always wanna put your best foot forward and do the best that you can with what you're given and then mm -hmm. build upon that. Because if it's not the best, 
when you show it, at least that you can do at that moment, right? Mm -hmm. With the time allotted, uh, you're always gonna wonder if it didn't work because you didn't try or if it didn't work because it actually isn't working for X, Y, Z, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Got I actually it. have a question. Um, one of our uh, viewers, Sam, has a question that might be related to that. Uh, he wanted to know if there was any particular scenes that made you want to rip your hair out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Lawrence, you, I know it's the same one that, uh, that I'm thinking about. So which, which one are you thinking about first? <laughs> well, there's a lot of people asking us about this another, a particular episode scene, but you guys go ahead. <laughs> episode one. Episode one? Oh, really? Which one? So uh, the the opening for episode one, uh, the uh, powder singing the Dear Friends Across the River song, right? That mm -hmm. wasn't originally the opening for episode one. Originally oh. the opening for episode one, which is actually how what really reeled Lawrence and I in to uh, work on the project was mm. uh, the Silco drowning scene. Mm. Uh, mm. And you literally start with the, that music and Silco falling down through the water. Mm -hmm. I never wonder what it's like to drown. And that's the first mm -hmm. thing that you hear from the show. Um, mm -hmm. But when we went back and restructured and rewrote all the episodes, we moved things around to episodes two and three and, you know, just mm -hmm. kind of shuffled some stuff. Um, and the, uh, that opening on the bridge changed like a thousand times really uh yeah yeah because there's a lot of stakes of like the first images that you see right right absolutely i mean I, and i think ultimately everyone was very happy where with where it landed but you can imagine what it was like to be like you know in the edit room knowing that this would be the first images you saw from a video game adaptation series which historically video game adaptations have not done very well uh, and, and like having to establish who your main characters are in a in a champion list of 150 plus champions, like there was a lot yep. of lot of baggage that you know that the or big shoes at these first couple of shots of the film. So yeah, we were actually like at the 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 original pilot. We were with Silco and Singe for like the first ten minutes of the pilot. Huh we were with him drowning mm -hmm. and then we're with him under you know in his in his lab under uh, a singe's lab and then the whole thing with the cat and the mouse all happened at the beginning wow uh, yeah and so you're you're essentially introduced to shimmer right out of the gate and the villains and then you go to the kids traipsing the rooftop yeah it's uh, like one of the concerns there was that we spent so much time even though it was a beautiful beautiful scene and still is like we spent so much time with our non-main heroes that, yeah. you know, one of the big concerns coming out of like, you know, focus groups and note sessions was like, how do we, how do we draw focus back to, you know, Vi and Powder and, and the kids basically, so. Yeah, the, the, end of the, the end of the pilot actually used to be uh, Decker taking Singe and transforming for the first time. When, when Silco turns around, he says, uh, when he's like, uh, uh, I'd like to I'd like to tell you something that I learned when I was about your age, boy. You know, power, real power comes to those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that whole thing actually used to be the end of the pilot originally and not where we moved it, which I believe is episode two. Yeah. That's interesting. On that note, guys, I'm really interested in, to hear about this, but like, do you guys have any thoughts on kind of like the first we talked about we touched on a little bit of like the importance of the first images that you show the audience like in the series, you know, like that importance. I mean, I mean, for anyone like looking to make a show or writing or storyboarding, like those first couple images, right? You can you talk about the importance of just kind of like easing the audience into that or, yeah. or punching them in the face. Yeah, go ahead. Or punching them in the face, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it's it's super important. I mean, not just necessarily the first images, but like, I think generally speaking, like whether you're talking movies or series, like, you know, you only have a couple of minutes, like maybe ballparking 10 minutes or so to like, you know, audiences will only suspend their disbelief for so long. So those first, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of minutes, those first couple of scenes are crucial in storytelling to 
like inform your audience as to what is this world that we're dealing with? What are the characters that we're dealing with, right? If you try and introduce ideas too much later after that, then it's, there's, there's definitely a lot more resistance that's met. And so keeping that in mind, that was one of the big deciding factors as to like why we wanted to put Vi and Powder up front right off the bat, because we wanted audiences to understand that these were these are the people that you're going to be following through this series. And I think ultimately, even though Ernesto and I were both super in love with the, you know, the so-called drowning and, and starting it off in this like dark moody idea. I think ultimately that was definitely the right call by, you know, the creative producers and the, and the directors. And I would assume that the series was about them then. So mm-hmm. go ahead. Exactly. Sorry. Real yeah, quick. no, exactly. And, and, and that was, you know, I think that was one of the big deciding factors when they actually went back and rewrote stuff like, you know, uh, when, when we stopped to go back and kind of reassess everything, uh, we had finished the pilot already. Um, well, like it was fully uh-huh. lit. I mean, we'd screened wow. it. We'd screened it for wow. internal, you know? And so when we decided like, we need to think about the series as a whole and, or mm-hmm. the season as a whole and what, what story we're really trying to tell here, which was, ended up being like, you know, fairly different than where that direction we were headed before. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know, I, it, I think it was a good call and those changing those images to make it about the relationship between these two sisters because ultimately the relationship is the relationship between them is a mirror of like of the relationship between Silco and Vander right and also the relationship between Piltover and Zahn right and and so uh it, it was definitely I think a really important choice and Christian Link is like, you know, the showrunner Christian Link is like, I mean, to me, like, he's kind of like a, he's, he's a genius, <laughs> you know? Uh, and he, uh, I remember when he walked into the edit bay and he was like, hey, so I'm thinking that we should do this. And for those of you that don't know, Christian is actually uh, m- very musically inclined. Like he used to be like a European rock star. And so- <laughs> Really? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And he actually- <laughs> If you guys are if you guys are at all um, know anything about uh, the League of Legends like music videos and cinematics and stuff, uh, the Curse of the Sad Mummy Boy, the Amumu one, that's Christian singing, um, mm. and that's him, you know, playing the piano and that like the like he's he's genius. He wrote the whole thing and directed that whole video, but uh, he he walked in with this uh, with this clip that he had edited. And it was like, um, it's kind of like what we call a rip where you take uh, shots from different movies and different things and you kind of piece it together to show it a concept idea of what you want to do. And he brought in, I don't remember what movie it was from, but he'd cut in this whole thing and this whole idea of this like fog of war and you're kind of seeing things, you don't really know what you're seeing, everything's on fire. And then he had the track a very rough version of the track underneath mm. that he was singing and it was so haunting and crazy and mm-hmm. um he did that wow. few, uh, he did that a few times throughout the show um and, and mm-hmm. so he did it for episode three as well and i heard that original version of the track that he sang for the end of episode three like a million times it was so beautiful and haunting but yeah so it, you know it, it, it was very important um to make sure that we rope people in real quick. Right. 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 Yeah. That's cool because Francesca actually had a question similar to uh, music. I noticed myself that with Arkeen, there's a lot of musical elements, almost like a, a music video. Uh, so like the way that you guys like still serve the story and still tying in music, it's like great in my opinion, but how did you guys try to figure that out because time music with like visual could get really crazy really fast it's a great <laughs> so how question how to do that it's a great question mm-hmm. well i mean i mean i think for one like the, the ongoing joke at riot is that like you know they don't they're not a video game company they're a music video <laughs> company because <laughs> 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 um, you know a lot of their a lot of their cinematics are are just like you know great pairings of of songs and and visuals essentially and so I mean, I, I would personally give a lot of the, the tip of the hat to, you know, Christian and the guys over in Fortiche. I mean, like 
they just really have a, a great musical mind when it comes to to both the the audio and the visual like compilation of the two. And so for I don't speak for Ernesto, but for me, it was really just following their lead and and going with you know what they what they wanted essentially. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you know uh, with the music video aspect of it. You know, yeah, for Tej, that's their that's their playground, right? Like you know, they, they're, they're visual masters at that. And, you know, uh, the director Arno, he, uh, he's, he's a, he's a geek like we are. And he loves, he loves anime. He loves comic books. He loves manga. And so he's, you know, he's there, like he, he stacks <clears throat> of stuff. So, you know, visually when it comes to that, you can tell like arcane, even in the pacing, the, uh, the fighting, a lot of that stuff has some like anime, you know, uh, uh, flavor to it, right? And so that is that stems a lot from the love that these guys have of all the all these things. And they did a lot of you know riots, uh, animated music videos and season starts and things like that. They're you know they did KDA, uh, Rise, um, Echo. They did uh, Get Jinxed, and so you know they're they're definitely well versed in in all of that stuff. Uh, they did oh they did, uh, um, uh, the uh, whatever the 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 new one was for arcane uh, what's it called uh, mm -hmm. you know the, uh, the one with imagine dragons yeah enemy oh Thank enemy you. right yeah so yeah they're 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 just really great at that um, yep yeah awesome right on um, so my next question so like um <clears throat> as far as like characters go um what we wanted to know as well of just like when you're in the editing bay and you're trying to um kind of put forth the character uh conflict and the character contrast and all that kind of stuff like how do you emphasize all of that storytelling character storytelling through editing and just sort of like um the way that you guys lay out the shots and the timing and everything like that, like uh, just to emphasize the, the character contrast. Yeah, I mean, I actually think, uh, I mean, as far as like laying out like character contrast, I think Arcane actually does a really good job, um, you know, just even from the get go with, with story and sort of showing these people who are very different in their walks of life, right? Like, you know, your Caitlin's, your Vi's, your, even your Vander's and your Soko's. But ultimately, I think the story does a really good job of actually showing how similar these people are, right? Like not just not just in the storytelling, but also in the way like you know Fortiche did their shots, where you literally have like mirror images between you know Vander and Vi and the way they were you know grabbing Soko's neck or Powder's neck in in those like extreme moments, right? Or storytelling wise, how like Soko eventually becomes a father to you know in the way that he hated that his friend became a father essentially. So. I think I think the the show as a whole, um, even though it shows these like extreme dichotomies in these people, honestly, it towards you know towards the the end of the show or even through the progression of the show, really shows us that there's a lot more that unites us in in general, right? Even between two two different centers, there's a lot more that unites us and divides us. So, mm -hmm. from from you know in animatic, I think we did uh, we did some exploration when it came to uh, music, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how, you know, what it sounded like when we were in Piltover versus what it sounded like when we were in Zahn. Oh, interesting. That's right. very interesting. And you, can, and you can tell, like, if you, if you yeah. watch the show, like, you know, music plays a big part in the show and it plays a big part in telling and, and helping you feel those, those, those emotions, right? Because the moment you're in the elevator and you get that, you know, and like you start getting that, like, really grunge. Yeah sound you're like oh we're about mm -hmm. to enter we're not we're no longer we're not in kansas anymore right we're about to enter mm -hmm. the, you know, the hole and uh you know and it's funny because again through iteration and through all of this stuff right that uh when you're going down the elevator the song that plays now is welcome to the playground but mm -hmm. that sound that i made just now with my mouth poorly that is the sound <laughs> That's the sound that I remember because that was the original score for it that that Alex Temple did. It was like this, mm. like, you know, you're going down this, like thing, 
and it was like yeah, really yeah, yeah, and, it yeah. and you were like oh snap yeah. and then you know once we started getting like a songs incorporated into there they changed that out to welcome to the playground but even welcome to the playground had a little bit of a, a grunge to it so it's these things that they did you know to help uh uh make us feel like we're we're in different places the contrast oh, between characters and locations really great man i love that i love that um kind of chinera you know look like you wanted to ask <laughs> the next well, question I, i'm just looking through uh the good questions here and uh tito has a good question what are some of the of your creative influences because you know i'm listening to you guys talking about your influences with uh, any arcane but did you have any influences good question. Uh, from your own path that you uh was able to sneak into arcane that's a great question i, I mean for for me not necessarily specifically arcane but like just throughout a lot of my work i'm i'm heavily influenced by anime i grew up watching it as a kid I love it to death. What's your favorite favorite anime? Go! Oh my gosh! Right now, I am obsessed with Attack on Titan. I have not had a chance Ooh. to catch up on this season yet. Like, I gotta sit down and 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 go through my Hulu queue, basically. But oh, I, man. I raise you, I raise you full metal. <laughs> <laughs> full metal is 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 but, amazing but, but, as well. But um, right yeah. now, right now, right now, it's Attack on Titan all time, Lawrence and uh, uh, <laughs> Ernesto all time. All time. I mean, I'll, I'll go a little retro on you. Like the one that got me started. I mean, like I, I watched, it wasn't the first one that I watched. I mean, like I'm older than that probably, but like, I mean, I watched like the, I watched all the Dragon Balls and stuff like that. But the one that got me like hooked on anime was uh, this anime called Ruin Kenshin back from like the, you know, the nineties or so. Or, oh yeah. Junior, Junior is a fan. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so it was tsunami your, block, the whole pension. block. Yeah. <laughs> I see your pension and raise you cowboy bebop. Yeah, I mean. Uh, wait, 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 wait. I'm going to say Gundam Wing. Gundam no, yeah, Wing. Yeah, I mean, like, okay, so that those are all like so Gundam Wing. You know, like uh, I used to watch uh, Evangelion. Like you know, all the stuff. Like uh, uh, those are all like awesome. But when you're talking about like all time, right? For me. Oh, yeah. like, for me, it, it, it's a, it, it is a toss up between Brotherhood and uh, and Cowboy Bebop. Oh, nice. And sometimes Trigon flips in there, but you know. Which one? Trigon. Oh, uh, Trigon. I mean, Trigon is basically, you know, Kenshin with a gun. So I guess I could give you that one. So it's fine. Oh, I mean, no. I was doing oh, no. Shots this. Fired. This, this will date me a bit, but like I was, I was watching Kenshin back in the day before there was streaming, before there was online. Like we were doing these things where like you had to, you couldn't get anime like through normal means. You had to like send off for like VHS copies that like people had to dub for you. <laughs> So like when I say that like I was like hardcore into like anime and Kenshin got me hooked, I'm I mean it. Like I jumped through hoops to get my episodes basically. So Ghost in Yo, the what I had to Ghost in the Shell. What I had to do. Oh, oh Kieran Ghost in the Shell, yeah. Shoot. <laughs> What I had to do is I, I used to live in uh, Brooklyn for a while. My father used to go to downtown Brooklyn and between a, a dumb store and a supermarket was a <sighs> hole in wall. What used to sell like bootleg DVDs and yep. VHS of the Dragon Ball. Yep, and yep. it was just dubbed, fan dubbed. That's how I got my stuff. That's how you did it. That, that was the only way to go about getting it. <laughs> I want to just watch it on like some like local channel at like six in the morning. Oh yeah, school. no, not even. I mean, like, I mean, that was that was like you know because all that all the uh, American broadcasts at the time were like censored or like severely cut down because I mean even <laughs> Dragon Ball right like they wouldn't show them like fucking Goku punching <laughs> through someone's <laughs> body basically. So, anyways, I, I digress. Anyways, to answer your question, okay. anime is a is a very strong influence, uh, not just in action obviously, but Love just. It. In timing and storytelling oh, yeah. like it's i mean it's a lot cooler to say it nowadays it was a lot less cooler back in the day to, yep. to say that but yep. it was definitely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for me um let me oh sorry go ahead Ernesto. Oh, no. uh, for me go actually ahead, uh, it's music um so i nope. i have like a huge huge rolodex in my mind of music and scores um so like i grew up listening to a lot of like classical music and film scores and so I, I just kind of have this like thing in my in my head, um, and we we did a lot of really really fun stuff at least like early on in animatic for Arcane. 
um, that I like really, like really enjoyed. Um, for example, like in episode two, episode two that you guys see is actually different than the episode two that we had edited originally. Um, mm. in, uh, in episode two, originally, we had this uh, scene that I loved that bummed me out that we took it out, but I understand why. Uh, the, uh, they, we kind of did a little bit of it, a little version of it, but uh, is when uh, when Vander gets taken away, right? Uh, by, yeah. by the group. Originally, mm -hmm. he is uh, get, like, he's helping the kids escape through the hatch. Uh, and then he hears Deckard and all of these like gangsters outside and they're uh, taking, they're about to take Shimmer and they're going to get into a fight with Vander. And it's the first time that Vander puts on like the knuckles again, right? And so mm. uh, he, he's mm. like preparing for battle and he puts on like the, the record, his record player. And mm -hmm. I, had done, I had done two really fun versions of it. Uh, I had done one version where he, uh, we hear Nina Simone Sinnerman. Uh, and it was like this cutting back and forth between Vander fighting uh, Decker mm -hmm. and his guys all like hulked out and the kids mm -hmm. running away. And then all of a sudden he gets mm. thrown through a window and like the song just echoes throughout, like uh, throughout uh, uh, the underground of uh, the lanes, mm -hmm. right? And it's like really haunting and creepy. Uh, and mm -hmm. then when we like soft locked that animatic, we had changed it to, uh, you guys know that song, like uh, So Happy Together, right? Uh, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it worked funny. really really well and it was really fun because wow. uh, at the very end of that of of that episode we would actually push in on all the different rooms in the uh the last drop that were all destroyed from the fight and there's like all this blood in the hallway and stuff and you're pushing into their room and like all this all their stuff is thrown on the ground and the record player is still playing and it's like so happy together. Da, 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 da. That's messed up. It was like really <laughs> creepy and haunting. It's messed up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like music for me is like a really big one for sure. Got it. Nah. Um, it's my turn. Your turn, Shanira. Your turn. Oh, I think it's I think it's your turn. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I, I, we, we just wanted to know, um, and maybe this was answered already, but favorite scene. Uh, we have here favorite episodes to work on, but favorite scene to work on, like to edit. And then like, what what struck you as an artist, you know? Uh, I mean, I Lawrence, think, go ahead. I think I, I, I would have to call out the end to episode three, um, where, uh, where Vi and Powder are just, you know, that, that really like heart tearing moment between them. Like, the reason why that one still holds a special place in, I think, all of our hearts, um, we just remembered the day we, we recorded uh, Mia for the, the Voice of Powder, uh, and, like, it was, it was such an amazing record session. She came in, and she, I mean, under the direction of uh, David Lyerly, she came in and just absolutely blew the entire room away with that, mm -hmm. with that performance, that, that, that heart-wrenching, like, you know, powder as she's, like, just in turmoil and pain and like screaming after her sister kind of thing. It still gets me. Like I still get chills when I think about, about that moment. Wow. It's so, so good. So yeah, wow. I have that one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, same Maybe. for me. Like we've been in, you know, hundreds of voice records and hundreds of, you know, these like sessions and we've worked with kids, adults, and I don't think anybody in that room was ready for that moment because we, you know, she was recording remotely. She was in the East coast, I think somewhere. And so we were kind of doing like a tele, like a, a tele record in, and we all kind of had our, our head down and we were just listening. And when she did that scream where she was like, why did you leave me? Uh, we all kind of looked up and we were like, whoa. And then the, you know, I was just trying to help. I was just trying to help. I was just trying to help. Like we all, like, I still get like, you know, a little bit of goosebumps and like, you know, because it was so raw and so real. Um, and David Lyerly, the, the, the casting director and voice director did such an amazing job making that room so comfortable for a kid, you know, to be able to open up like that and do, and, and, and do these performances and uh, echo as well. 
you know, uh, I forget the, I forget the boy's name, uh, but he was incredible. The little young echo. Uh, he was really, really great. And it was that whole, that whole scene was just amazing because while we did change a lot of things when we went back to rewrite that moment at the end of episode three, the monkey bomb and, and the moment with everybody dying and Vander and powder and all that, that all stayed the same. No, we all knew that no matter what we changed, like that moment needed to stay that moment. And it was, I think it just, it was, it just turned out so great. Awesome. Right on, man. Um, what do you think, what do you think, Janera? Should we go to uh, Q&A? Yeah, I think we should, because there's a lot of questions that is still <laughs> unanswered. All right. Uh, All right. But, so, uh, at, who's sorry, saying? go ahead, Janera. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, so Lawrence and Ernesto, uh, like at this point, like we've, I've heard enough of my talking already. So like just to interact with our, with our audience, um, we invite them on to just ask questions that they have for you guys based on, uh, like the panel stuff. So Sam, what's going on? How you doing, man? Hi. <laughs> Hi, um, how are you? Hi. Um, what's it called? I am trying to think because I do have two questions to ask. Yeah, ask, ask, ask both. Ask both. Both. Oh, yeah. okay. Thank you. So, um, Arcane was edited like really beautifully. I know, like, it's something that usually goes unsaid, but I felt like most of the scenes were just super natural compared to like a lot of the other like shows that I've been watching. Like I watched an entire video dissecting like that Victor running scene. I was like, oh wow, that's so cool. Okay, anyway, sorry, I was gonna <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> one of the biggest <laughs> sorry. No, um, no, 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 don't bother. Um, what are like the biggest skills someone should refine if they want to like be a good editor? Oh, all right, Lawrence. Uh, I mean, one, get to know your tools, right? So your tools, generally speaking, are like, you know, your, your final cuts, your avids, uh, you know, you can, you can only be as good as, as proficient as you are with your tools. Um, but then outside of that, you know, on an artistic level, I guess, um, I would highly recommend anyone aspiring to, you know, better themselves as an editor, really study storytelling, understand, you know, what you know timing and in, in that relation as far as like tv shows or features or whatever understand storytelling what each scene is trying to do and how you can best accomplish doing that and a good way of learning that in my book is to go and watch um go and watch movies that have you know director's cuts or you know special edition cuts or theatrical kind of cuts and see what different types of cuts do to the storytelling in those movies, right? Like things that spring to mind would be like, you know, the Star Wars movies or the Lord of the Rings movies or, you know, Blade Runner. Like go back and watch those and try and understand what adding this scene or adding this moment does to the storytelling in that moment. And that will kind of help you learn and inform what the craft does for, for the movie or the show. Yeah, I mean, look what happened with Justice League, you know, the Zack Snyder cut, right? Like the, I mean, the meat and potatoes were kind of still there, but it was done completely differently you know, the story was, the story was told differently and choices were made differently. They didn't really go back and reshoot anything. They had it all. It was just choices that were made, right? Um, so it, it's definitely learning, you know, what, learning what makes a good character, right? A lot of times you'll find that uh, main characters aren't an active participant in their own journey. They're just kind of being carried through and mm -hmm. being able to recognize that and say like, you know, th why this choice is being made for them. They're not making the choice. They're not moving their journey forward. You, so being mm -hmm. able to identify why things aren't working is important, right? Um, for me, uh, one of the big things that has helped me as an editor is like, I, you know, I consider myself a jack of all trades, right? Like I, I, I was a compositor. I've done music. I, you know, edit, I direct, write, you know, uh, can draw. And while, you know, I think the misuse of the jack of all trades, you know, is a master of none, the full quote is a map, a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one, right? And so mm. that's the full quote. And so that, to me, that really does 
apply. You know, like I know Photoshop, After Effects, Flame, I know how to CG model, I know how to animate because you never know. Like on Arcane, for example, Lawrence and I left Arcane for a while and we were asked to come back uh, and kind of usher it in through the end. But one of the mm. things that we ended up doing because there wasn't bandwidth was the shower scene uh, with Caitlin where she's showering before she's kidnapped by Jinx. Um, there was, we were, there was too much showing. And so like we went in and composited steam, you know? Sorry guys. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah, no. <laughs> we would have left, we would have left it, but you know, it's, it's what it is. Mm -hmm. And so, but that was something that we wouldn't have been able to do had we not had these skills and learn these skills, you know? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was super um, helpful. Thank you guys for answering my question. This is like one of my favorite talks that I've attended like in oh, the past awesome. year. It's so, this is such a good environment. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Oh, oh you had one more. Uh, Sam. <laughs> oh, um, Sam, you had one more. Oh, are you? Oh, oh, it's kind of similar to my other question. I was just going to oh, ask, okay. like, yeah, like what the thought process was like for editing different scenes, you know, but I think you guys like pretty much covered it in your like answer. So thank you very much. Right on. Yeah, you bet. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I then. Oh, okay. Um, thank you so much um, for letting me ask my question. But my question was. Were there any like challenges or difficulties you found that was unique to Arcane that you've never like encountered before in like previous productions or previous works that you've done? Uh, yeah. <laughs> how, how much time do you have? <laughs> uh, ge generically speaking, I would say Arcane is very uh, is very unique in the sense that one of the things that uh, you know Christian and Alex asked us to do early on was to cut Arcane like a live action show. Um, that's not always the case. In fact, most times, you know, animated shows are a lot more family friendly or, you know, a lot more four quadrant as they as like to put it. And so uh, it, it was definitely a change in edit mentality, I think for, for everyone involved. And I think partially, or not partially, a, a lot of, uh, of the credit also goes to, you know, the team in, in, in Paris, the editors in Paris, as well as, the, the rest of the editors and right, but we all had to get together and kind of decide on a, you know, a, a particular kind of artistic timing to allow for moments to breathe, allow for characters to really flesh out uh, in their scenes and allow them to time to act essentially. Yeah, you know, our Arcane had, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of different things like that. You know, every production uh, is different, right? Every production has its own unique set of challenges. And, uh, you know, whether you've done it a million times, you're, everybody's always kind of reinventing the wheel for some reason every time we start, right? And so uh, Arcane, Lawrence is right, we had that mandate from Christian and Alex that was this treat it like a live action show, right? From the music, to the sound effects, to the pacing, to the cadence. Uh, you know, we've worked on shows, animated shows where, you know, and movies where everything is just kind of crammed together, right? Like, you know, everything's like, dialogue is just on top of each other and arcane for me at least was the first show or anything that i've worked on that said like treat it like it was live action give characters the time to breathe because we're going to have them act they're going to emote they're going to you you have to sit with these characters in these moments because you want them to you want these moments to feel earned and believable uh, Fortige did this really great thing with camera. Somebody had mentioned, you know, uh, that it didn't feel, that it was like different. It, it felt really super different when, when you're watching it. Yeah. One of the things that you may not notice that is different is actually the way that they treat camera is treated like there is actually a live action camera person where in animation, a lot of times the camera almost follows the action perfectly like you know exactly where the action is mm -hmm. going to be, and you like you you know it's going to be here. You're going to go here. You're going to go here, and so the camera is 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 fluid in that way. Where mm -hmm. with Arcane, there's a slight delay in camera movement, like there would be with a cameraman, because this person is going to go over here. There's a, a beat. You know, it's it's almost it's very organic, and there were a lot of these things that were different with you know with Arcane 
Yeah, even like even like the focus pulling, for instance. I think it's like the first shot of Vi's hand as in the episode one where they're climbing up. It was a deliberate intent to to make it so it seemed like a, a real cameraman was trying to find the. the oh my god! Man. Man. So. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you know that's so, um, that's, so, that's amazing. And, and, <laughs> I love that. And and, and Bob, you, you know, as an animator, you know that like character density and character count is like a huge deal, right? Um, mm -hmm. in, in, in features, you can do sim and like sim, uh, 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 crowds, right. Um, and, and things mm -hmm. like that. But in TV, you're kind of like in series, you're kind of boxed in notice in, in arcane, like that's not really the case. Like if you look down at Zon in that elevator shot, you don't just see people like pose there, not doing something. Everybody's doing something. Yeah. And that's like independently animated. You know, yeah. and and we you yeah. know we got a lot of like I think we got a lot of like things online where people were like, well, this was motion captured. Look at how it is. It was not motion captured. You know, and so oh. yeah, that's something I gotta let my little. <laughs> uh, really quickly, Lawrence, uh, I'm gonna bring on Connor, but um, is there anything or or now that you're back, uh, Ernesto, like what can animation do to kind of like level up their game in terms of kind of like everything you guys are talking about. Oh, yeah, Lawrence. I mean, we, I think we feel very strongly about this. <laughs> I, 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 I got a sense. I got a sense. I got a sense. I kind of missed the question, honestly. Well, so what was it like? Oh, yeah, animation? sorry. Um, you know, everything you guys are talking about, like with animation, though, of like how can animation kind of level up its game in terms of kind of cinematography, editing, um, storytelling, and all that kind of stuff to be on that uh, kind of like, like what's our what's our what's our next like level up stage? Yeah, you no, know, Ernesto's you right. working I, in. Go ahead. No, no, Ernesto is absolutely correct. Like this is this is a a topic that is really close to our hearts. Um, and I think mm -hmm. I think Arcane is actually you know one of the forefronts of of what I hope to be a new wave of animation type. Um, mm -hmm. but it's like this idea because I think specifically in in the U.S. Um, animation has until recently. Uh, oftentimes has been sort of like boxed into sort of like a, you know, a younger audience. And I think with the advent of like, you know, even like, for instance, like Love, Death and Robots, which has been super popular on Netflix. And, you know, obviously for all of us anime fans out there, we know that animation is fully capable of telling the full range of human stories and emotions. And I think Arcane does a brilliant, brilliant job of, of ushering that into, you know, the video game adaptation era. And so I think if I can speak on Ernesto and I's behalf, it's like we're excited about, you know, seeing animation further this along so that we can tell more diverse stories, more mature stories, and sort of, yep. you know, show show everyone that animation can, you know, be more than just talking talking animals, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> you giving you got to give people more credit I think, than what a lot of animation does. Um, you know, I think a lot of times it's kind of uh, you know aged down a bit out of fear because the medium itself is mm. meant more for children. But Arcane, while it is not really great for younger kids, I think from a storytelling perspective, it does show that like you got to give people credit, man. Just, just that they will figure it out. Like they yeah. will, they they will accept it for what for what it is, what you're offering, you know. And that, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, like Full Metal Alchemist does a really good job of blending the, the comedy and the uh, and the the, the drama. Uber serious. <laughs> right on. It gives right on, a, man. It's something that we both Lawrence and I feel that anime is kind of years ahead of right than western traditional animation and uh it seems like we're kind of that that shift is happening uh the boys you know like all these different like shows are coming out that are mm. little other, yeah little mm -hmm. other. yeah i mean and we're like talking to our colleagues too like you know across the board all of us you know are kind of of the same generation now who grew up on you know you know eastern animation japanese anime and all that kind of stuff and so like even our, our fellow colleagues and coworkers who work in the industry we're all kind of of the same mindset where it's like, we know, we know we can do yeah. this and not just that, but we also know audiences yeah. want this stuff. So it's like, yeah, we want to see sure. it. Yeah. Oh, it, 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 
you know, it'll get us excited too. Like it's the reason why I left DreamWorks. Yeah. Right? You know, I had a very comfortable position at DreamWorks. I could have still, you know, I could have been there for many, many more years, you know, but the moment that I walked into that room at Riot and Christian played that audio when he said, you know, ever wonder what it's like to drown. I was like, <laughs> yes, every day, let's yeah. go. You're like, yeah, <laughs> yes. I mean, oh, for yeah. me, for me, it was similar. It was, I, and during my first couple of meetings, I read the script for, you know, what was now the end of episode three. And I was like, wait a second, you kill off all the kids in episode three? Yeah. Heck yeah, sign me up. Well, how do I, how do I get this show? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Uh, Connor, um, do you want to ask you a question, man? Thank you for, uh, thank you for holding out. Connor Stanley, what up? Hey, Hi, um, first off, big fan. Thanks, man. Thank you, thank you. So my question is, um, because Arcane is based off League of Legends, is the whole storyline based off the game? Well, I mean, the, the game is like, you know, it's a, a top down, right? So like there's, from, from that perspective, it, it's a glorified capture the flag, right? Um, but, you know, they, all these characters have backstories and all these different things. And I think some of those backstories play into a lot of this, but, you know, the story itself is original uh, in its design. And um, while still trying to stay true to some of the lores and as much without having to like retcon everything, right? Um, you know, and there is, there is some difficulty that comes with that because you may be letting some people down that love certain stories and origin stories and this and that. And at the same time, you're not alienating those that don't have that don't know anything about our uh, uh, about League of Legends, right? Because that, that's the that, key. Yeah, like that's the that's the question I get asked a lot is like whether or not you have to have played the game in order to understand the show, and the answer is absolutely not. You don't have to play the game. the The show does a really good job of introducing these characters to a completely uninitiated audience. Um, and the other good thing is that the show is you know uh, distributed by Netflix, but Riot Games, you know, with the help of Fortiche, is completely you know, in control of, of the show's story. And so this is coming straight from the creators of the characters and of the game, as far as what the, what the story and the, you know, what season two will bring you guys, I guess. Because <laughs> if you haven't played the game, all you can do is like slam on your keyboard and scream into a paper bag. And you <laughs> that's, that's me with all games, by the way. Yeah, as, uh, as, like, a, as like a support player, like I tell you right now, like yeah, just scream into a paper bag, you, you kind of get the gist, like, but you know, the whole, you know, the whole point of, I, I think one of the, one, you know, the curse of the video game adaptation, right, is that, um, I, you know, Arcane is being kind of uh, put out there as like the one that kind of broke that curse of the video game, yeah. the video game adaptation. Yeah. And so it, it's like, a, so it's like an origin story. Right, right. But, you know, the, the, the main thing about anything when it comes to film or series or whatever it is, it's all about story and characters. It, it doesn't matter if it's a video game adaptation or not. It's about story and characters because for those people that watched Arcane and had no idea that it was League of Legends based, it just had to be a good story, right? Right. That is true yeah. because I didn't know anything about League of Legends. I've heard of it, never played it. I mean, I'm a, I, I am a gamer, but never did it. But uh, I just came in blind and I enjoyed it. So yeah. Uh, yeah, that, right. that is true. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get that. I didn't play League of Legends at all, but I just, you know, fell in love with Arcane right away. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Connor. Yeah, thank um, you. Kaylee. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. Um, Kaylee, Lynn, do you want to ask your uh, question? Hi, yeah. Um, thank you so much for organizing this and taking the time, Lawrence and Ernesto. Oh, of course. Um, my question is, so did you guys have a large part in uh, editing the anime music video? Because there are so many editorial details and it, it hits different before watching the series and then after watching the series. Um, <laughs> what's it like diving so deeply into the psychology of characters as well as the audience? 
Yeah, uh, um, so we were not responsible for editing the enemy's music video. Uh, that was uh, that was the really talented editors over in Paris at Fortiche. Um, I, I don't know specifically which one, if you don't know. Right, so. Gilad. Gilad, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there. So as a, as a blanket statement, I mean, Arcane had a whole team of editors on it, right? We had we had teams in, in America here, uh, or in Los Angeles here, and then we had a whole another team in, in uh, Paris. And I would probably forget names if I try to name off names, but you know, as far as the enemy music video itself, that was that was all the Paris guys. They they did an amazing job. Arno, the uh, direct, like you know, one of the main directors that we worked with, uh, he uh, Arno Delord, he is like like I was saying earlier, he's a visual genius, right? And I, you know, he also edits too. Um, and so I'm pretty sure it was between him and Gilad kind of putting that putting that together. Yeah, and uh, they did a fantastic job, and they snuck a bunch of Easter eggs in there if you guys are, uh, you know, mm. if you guys are into that. <laughs> awesome. So I want to take a question from Anonymous. Uh, so Anonymous wanted to know what editing software did you guys use to create Arcane Style? Because I'm curious myself. Well, we, it was Avid on, on our site, right? And then Premiere. Well, it's it started on Premiere. Right, yeah. And then uh, it was, you know, when we first came on, it was kind of an interesting workflow where everybody was. Um, and so it started off with Premiere and then it went to Avid. And then when we left, it went back to Premiere. Um, and so we mm. ended it just kind of flip flop back and forth. Um, mm. and, but, you know, I think it, it primarily spent most of its time living in Premiere. This is where the whole, you know, Jack of all trades becomes really important because if you don't know how to yeah. use both of them, you would not have been able to work on the show. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I, I want to just be clear on a uh, uh, terminology that you that you use there, uh, anonymous. You you asked about uh, the uh, uh, what you know software we use to make the style of Arcane, right? Uh, you know, while editing sets the like you know the story and the cadence and the pacing and all the stuff, you know stylistically the way that it looks is not done by us right so i just wanted to i just wanted to clarify that in case that was kind of a misconception like we didn't create the style of it you know that was done by a, a massive group of incredibly talented artists animators painters uh lighters you know character designers uh, yeah like uh you know storyboard artists like mm -hmm. so, yeah i just want to be clear about that 100 yeah. percent um, Kristen. Oh, Kristen, um, do you have a question? Hi, Kristen. Hello. Hello. Oh my gosh. Uh, hello. You guys, the work you do is incredible. I'm a story artist and I'm like, so like, I, I understand a little bit of the editing and stuff and we've all been freaking out about your show, um, in our little coworker chat, but <laughs> I just wanted to ask, uh, there is something really like musical about editing and you mentioned that Ernesto. So I was just curious of like, you know, did you guys grow up playing instruments or like what was music like? Was that a huge role in like editing or does that affect your editing at all? I don't know. There is like something about like the pacing. I would love to know more about that. It's a great question. Great question. Lawrence, go. You really want to, you're the one who's inspired by music. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I grew up playing, you know, um, I grew up in a relatively traditional Asian family. So, you know, piano it was definitely one of the, the first instruments I picked up. I did trumpet uh, in high school, some percussion and stuff as well. Um, but you're absolutely correct in that, you know, music or more appropriately, like the pacing and timing that you get with that kind of stuff is super important when it comes to editing. I mean, a lot, a lot of times, I mean, I think Ernesto does this too, but a lot of times when I start off on a sequence, like I pick a attempt score that I use as kind of like the, the emotional basis for what that scene is going to be. And we don't always stick with it in the end, ultimately, but it helps kind of like inform my cuts and gives me sort of a tempo for how I want to pace my boards and my action. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I also uh, grew up playing trumpet. Um, and uh, for me, music, yeah, like I was saying earlier, plays a, a huge part in, in my editing. Um, I actually go through, before I show anything, I actually go through like different stages of editing. Um, I, you know, I'll, you'll edit, I'll edit it with just dialogue it's like my first like rough assembly pass and then I'll do another pass of that and then I'll go in and I'll start dropping sound effects in and I'll do another edit pass of that 
And then when I drop music in, that's going to be like a huge, like, you know, like determination for me on how the determining factor for me on how things are paced out and uh, yeah. certain cadence of certain things, because like, you don't realize like, a lot of times how like music hits at like certain moments. And uh, if the organic flow of that music and how it really affects that scene, right? And sometimes you may think that things are playing nice and then you drop music and then you're like, oh man, if I just held this a little bit longer, it would play really, really great, you know? Um, and, and, and so music absolutely plays a huge, huge part in the pacing and cadence of editing. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's like, Kristen, you said you're like a, did you say you were a storyboard artist at Netflix or? Yeah, yeah I'm a story artist. Yeah, so I imagine like in a similar way, right? Like sometimes I know a lot of storyboard friends like, you know, put on some sort of music based upon the, the scene they're doing, right? So if it's like a, you know, like a sad or, you know, like really dramatic scene, it's like you throw on some music to help get you in the mood as you're, as you're doing your pieces. Very similar thing for us as well when we're working with the boards. Yeah. Hey. Um, I, I, so I, 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 I've never actually mentioned it in any other panel before. So I kind of want to throw this out since we're talking about like the cadence of cuts and things like that. Um, anybody that's aspiring to be an editor, I, I want you to try this technique that I've kind of been working on for many years. Um, I call it peripheral editing, right? Uh, have you ever been watching something and out of the corner of your eye, it was like, oh, that was weird. And then you kind of go back and you like, you rewind it and you're like, why does that feel so weird? Right. It was because like instinctually organically, like you're, you see something and, and that's off and it kind of triggers you. And you're like, well, that was weird. I do that sometimes when I'm editing, I will do like all my passes and then I'll look down, I'll, I'll hit play and I'll look down at the timeline and not the viewer or canvas. And if something is jarring out of my peripheral, right, I'll stop and I'll fix it until it doesn't do that for me anymore. Um, hmm. And then I'll play it out and I'll watch it and it just feels more fluid and organic as it goes through. But it, it actually hmm. is something that is really, uh, and, and I can tell you now, the more that I've worked on it, the more that I've done this, I can 99.9% .9 of the time, I can tell you if just by looking at it on my timeline, if the reason it didn't work, without even marking an in and out or checking it is if because there's an off number of frames on a panel next to an even number of frames on a panel and it popped because there was just like an inconsistency in time. And, and, and so it's a really weird thing that happens the more and more you do it, you just organically can tell if there is, you know, something mm -hmm. off. And so try that if you guys want, just kind of out of, you know, out of the corner of your eye, just play something and see if it jars <laughs> for you. And, and, and you start to believe it. Low in cadence. Believe it. Yeah. Right, right. Um, that's interesting, man. That's so interesting. I love that technical, I love the technical stuff. That's so cool. Um, so we're gonna, um, Chanera, if you don't mind, and um, we're gonna, Ariana, like we can, we can kind of wrap up with your question just to respect the, uh, uh, panelists time but you've had a great question do you want to you want to ask the uh, panelists ariana hi thank you guys so much for doing this oh hi hey um i was wondering if you guys could maybe go over what the basics of like just kind of what editing is i think i'm still a little confused as to where it takes place in the whole production process um and how it differs from live action like is it arranging and timing the storyboards or is it something else yeah so i mean so you're talking about animation editing in particular versus live action editing? Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so one of the big misconceptions or one of the first things that it differs in between uh, from live action is that uh, editors and animation are brought on like almost at the very beginning of the show. It's like usually, you know, the second department hired after your director or your, or your writer basically, because we're there from this onset to essentially help explore the script and the story. And so, you know, at stage one, you're talking about working with storyboards where you have a slew of storyboard artists working, delivering hundreds of thousands of scripts, or sorry, hundreds of thousands of boards uh, to your editors to help pace out and time out the, you know, the, the episode or the, the scene as you see fit. And then the editors are with you all the way until, until the end of the show, going through each stage of animation, through layout, through animation, through, through lighting, through even through, you know, traditionally, I guess what you call post, 
which would be like DI and, and mix. So, you know, the edit team is, is there compared to a live action team, which is usually brought on towards the end or once everything's shot in the can, the animation edit team is there from almost day one. Yeah, interestingly enough, the, the overlap between a live action editor and animation editor doesn't really come in until like we're in layout. Right, because at that point we've timed out shots and we've sent it over to layout, and then we're actually receiving, you know, shots back that are no longer storyboards, right? And then we can start kind of extending out or holding or doing this and that. Then it starts to feel a little bit more like what you would know as like your traditional editing, because we're working with like clips as opposed to, you know, storyboards, right? But yeah, mm -hmm. long story, we're first ones in, pretty much last ones out, um, and it. In, in live action, you know, you're kind of pigeon held to performances to a certain degree, right? The timing of somebody's delivery, you can cut to somewhere else, but if you're cutting too much to speed up that, it, you know, uh, performance, it, then it just becomes choppy, right? You're cutting just for the sake of cutting. But in animation, we are responsible for the pacing of a shot, how long it takes to do something, how, you know, the, even the timing of, of, of dialogue, you know, we cut dialogue and move it around and put different takes and this and that, you know, mix and match. So it, it's, it is very different and a lot more involved, honestly, mm -hmm. because we're still doing a lot of the same things, you know, that the live action editors have to do when it comes to storytelling and cutting and pacing and this and that. But we also have the added stuff of like having to be responsible for the timing of actual movement and shots and this. And then on top of that, sometimes even drawing stuff like, you know, and creating new shots and, and this and that. So, yeah. Got it. Yeah. To, sim to simplify it, like from a live action terminology, just imagine if your live action film was entirely VFX, like to put it in one term, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's really helpful. Awesome. Right on. Well, we're at time. Um, Shinner, did you want to ask, like, uh, do you want to wrap it up for us? What do you think? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, we're going to wrap it up. But I do have a question for Ernesto and Lawrence. Uh, what would be one thing that you would, just a little snippet, like, what would you tell our Rise of followers, like, you know, trying to get into industry, what would be that one thing that you want to tell them? Into the editing industry? Uh, or just well, in the industry in general? Yeah. Editing specifically or the industry in general or animation? Industry? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think, um, um, like if anyone wanted to get into editing, um, like you guys are doing now, um, what, what are some things they can work on, you know, to, to follow in your footsteps? Well, so like uh, kind of what I was touching on before, right? Like editing is an unusual craft in the sense that we don't normally create uh, our own pieces, right? We have to, we edit something, right? Whether it be shots, whether it be boards, whether it be, you know, whatever the case may be. So I think if, you're, if your desire is to become an editor, one of the, and this might go without saying, but I'll say it anyways. If your desire is to become an editor, one of the most important things for you to do is to pair up or meet other people who are in other departments, right? camera guys, mm -hmm. uh, actors, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. artists, whatever the case may be, because you, you, you need to edit something. And unless you want to be your own camera guy or your own, you know, artist or whatever the case may be, um, you're going to have to find somebody who can work with you and supply you with things to actually edit. So I would highly mm -hmm. recommend, you know, if you've, if you've just moved out to Los Angeles and you're, you're looking to break into the industry, like, you know, meet some people, go to some, some meetups, find a couple of friends and start, creating that little like core group of, you know, filmmakers that you can help edit their things. And trust me, there are, there is not a shortage of, of people out there who need that help. So. I think for me along the same vein as Lawrence, um, it's about relationships really. Right. Um, mm -hmm. This whole industry is about relationships and mm -hmm. um, you know, just be kind to people. Cause you know, not just because you never know who they're going to become, but just be kind to people. Like, uh, treat everyone, you know, with respect. Don't be, don't be mean to people. Um, if you can help, help. Um, I think that, uh, you know, some of the biggest lessons for me that I learned were from people that were not super great and nice to me when I was younger. 
you know, and um, I, and the reason that those were important to me is because it showed me what I didn't want to do, mm -hmm. how I didn't want to be. So um, you know, just be kind and build relationships, um, learn your craft. And when you, when you show up for work, show up, like yeah. bring your A game when you're doing stuff, like don't just show, you know, everybody has a different way of doing stuff, right? Like I, we've all worked with editors and other people who, you know, they'll show bare minimum or they'll do this and that, and they kind of have their thing, but like, yeah, bring your A game, like, go in and because we always forget as especially editors we are artists and it's 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 hard to say that sometimes because we don't you know we don't really consider ourselves artists in the same way like you know uh, but you know uh, like painters or you know uh, in the traditional mediums but we are artists and we are storytellers and as mm -hmm. such we kind of are exposed nerves right very and vulnerable very vulnerable people. very vulnerable um but you, so you want to present your art the best that you can because it, it you're show, you're showing it all when you're showing this because it shows your 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 taste, your sensibility, your 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 cadence, your knowledge of your your stuff. It, it really is all encompassing, and if you can elicit emotions from people when you show them stuff and you you know and you're really trying, it really comes it really comes through. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one thing i've <clears throat> one thing i've noticed about you lawrence and uh, ernesto is that you come in and you're passionate about it so 100 percent exactly what ernesto said come in passionate about it you love it and you know otherwise you shouldn't be pursuing it um but um all that i wanted to say is like that comes through in like everything you guys say and the the advice that you guys dispense um but uh yeah that's i mean we'll let you guys go other than that man thank you so much chanira killed it crushed it thank you so much for co-moderating uh oh, no, lawrence thank you bobby our... <laughs> <laughs> so lawrence thank you so much for doing this um putting a lot of value out there uh into the world um we're gonna we're gonna upload this uh video up into our YouTube channel, like two weeks, three weeks. But uh, thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you so much for your passion. Thank you. Congratulations on how well our team is doing. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully we can we can sort of catch up uh, in person at some point. You know, because we all live in LA and New Jersey. New Jersey, come out, <laughs> come out uh, 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 for like in Lightbox Expo or something like that. But thank you so much. Thank you attendees for coming. Thank you for the great questions. And um, this is lovely, man. Thank you guys so much. And and uh, we had a moment, we were, we bonded and this is wonderful. So thank you so much guys, um, yes. everyone out there in the chat. Thank you and, so uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we really appreciate your time and have a great rest of your weekend. Chanira, sign us off, whatever you want to say. All right, Rise Up fam, it's the end. So we'll see you next time. Stay tuned, all right? <laughs> Bye.